I'd like to give a, an explanation of one of the more famous and influential theodicies that we've got in modern philosophy of religion. A uh, British philosopher, John Hick, gives us a version of an argument that you've probably heard before. This is the same thing your grandpa told you when you were complaining about your job. And he said, well, it builds character. Uh, John Hick wants to argue that the suffering in the world that we encounter builds moral character. So let's take a look at the details. This argument has been uh, widely influential and many people take it as a, as a given that this is the, the, the single best statement of this sort of position in um, modern philosophical discussions. All right, so one of the first questions that Hick has is to invert this discussion and, and ask this question, what sort of world would an omnipotent God or an, uh, an omni-God create for us? That is, all-powerful, all-knowledgeable, and all-good. And as Hick sees it, he thinks that uh, the problem of evil atheists, those people motivated to atheism by the problem of evil, have got things backwards. Uh, they're looking for the wrong sort of thing. Uh, Hick thinks that the question ought to be what kind of world would God want to put us in, not why are we enduring so much hardship. And when you zoom out and look at it from a divine perspective and you see it Hick's way, you get this kind of uh, angle on the question. A good parent doesn't want their child's life to be free of challenges and pain. A world with adversity and personal moral responsibility builds virtue and causes, uh, causes us to grow into better people. So um, instead of just being pain-free and happiness and ice cream sundaes and joy all the time, that's the wrong way to look at this. Um, that in fact that would be doing us a disservice. The challenges, even really severe, really hard challenges, are out for us in the bigger picture. Okay, so a bit of background here. Um, Hick, uh, breaking with some tradition here, says look, uh, humans weren't created in their finished, finite, finitely perfect form. Rather, they're still in a process of creation and growth towards perfection. And this is uh, Hick uh, making a slight acknowledgement about, uh, we have to think, he's making an acknowledgement about uh, evolution and natural selection. So he's going to flip the, the standard picture of Adam and Eve as being perfect and then falling away by sin. Uh, and rather we should think of humans as going through sort of two stages of develop, development. One of them anthropological and the next moral. Modern anthropological evidence shows that we were in a lesser lower animal form before and now we're capable of rising and growing towards God and transcending this limited material existence in moral, spiritual, and intellectual ways. Okay, so um, that long interlude of natural organic development through the eons brings us to this state and once we're here we've got this ability now because we're uh, free, autonomous, rational, and responsible persons, and we're capable of a personal relationship with the Creator. Now that's not to say that everybody is free and autonomous and rational all the time, but at least we're capable of that. And now that we're capable of, of achieving this sort of ideal standard, or at least getting closer to this kind of behavior, now we're in a position to be able to have a personal relationship with the Creator. and. Furthermore, certain kinds of growth now that we're here, we've got this organic growth, now moral growth. There's certain kinds of moral growth that cannot be performed by an omnipotent being because they require the free and self-directed will of humans to occur. Okay, now there's a lot going on here. First, note that cannot and omnipotent are in the same sentence. And we've seen this before. We can presume that Hick is employing the same notion we've been talking about of omnipotence LP, right? If you say that God, that, that certain kinds of growth cannot be performed by an omnipotent being. Well, how can that even make sense if we mean omnipotence is the power to do anything? Well, pretty clearly Hicks, what Hick has got in mind is, look, God can make you free or God can make you do something, but he can't make you freely do it. So that's Hick understanding omnipotence in the LP sense. There's only logically possible actions that God's capable of. Um, furthermore, I need to make a, a very special and a very important distinction here that even though Hick is 
uh, employing the notion of freedom here, and he and and this plays an integral part of this theodicy. Hick is not giving the free will defense. The free will defense. Uh, the best example comes from Alvin Plantinga, and the free will defense is is another idea. It's this notion that um, freedom itself is valuable, and once God makes free creatures, then that means that what they do next is up to them. It's up, it's up to their uh, their causal powers to make things unfold or not unfold. So once God makes free creatures, there's things in the world that God can't control. But freedom itself is valuable. So God sees, um, according to the free will defense, God values freedom more than God puts a disvalue on the evil things that people freely do. Okay, now freedom here in Hick is just a precursor. Freedom is a presumption or it's a it's a background condition that now makes it possible for moral growth to happen. Okay, so so moral virtue or this moral uh, growth defense that Hick is giving goes beyond the free will defense. Don't mix Hick and Plantinga up on this basic point about the free will defense. <clears throat> We're getting to the essential parts of uh, Hick's uh, moral growth defense. Okay, so God values free moral growth, and there's no other way to get it. And Hicks got lots of beautiful, rich lines here. It's a very compelling sort of argument. One who has attained to goodness by meeting and eventually mastering temptations, and thus by rightly making responsible choices in concrete situations, is good in a richer and more valuable sense than if they had been created innocent or virtuous from the start. Okay, so Hick is very clearly putting a direct value on the process. There's something about coming up against a real temptation, a real challenge, <clears throat> a real problem, and then facing that concrete problem and making the choice, and then the development of your moral character through those choices improves you. And the ancient notion of moral virtue here comes from Aristotle, and it's, the, and it's this idea that we habituate good choices, and it becomes a sort of permanent, um, resilient part of your character. That you're not just honest once, but you're honest over and over and over again, and you develop this habituated um, personality trait, this character, this virtue. And and Hicks clearly relying on that kind of Aristotelian notion that. Um, we need to be able to face temptations again and again and then make these choices and then virtue will uh, evolve or develop in us out of those repeated choices. And that, says Hick, and this is a really important line here, that, says Hick, is makes you a better person than if, that's good in a richer and more valuable sense, so the kind of goodness that comes out of that process is better than if God had just zapped virtue into us from the start. Uh, so whatever God could do to you from the outset, he can't do that. God can't make virtue. Virtue is something that you get from your choices and your actions. Okay, so um, Hick needs to assert something like this, that the process produces something that can't be achieved any other way, even by an omnipotent God. Uh, because notice that if it was possible to have that kind of goodness or that kind of virtue endowed in us from the outset, then there could be no justifying suffering. And we've talked about the, the sort of super problem of evil before, or the, or the paradox of evil if we adopt this omnipotent A view. Look, um, the moral character, uh, you know, uh, evil suffering builds moral character defense just won't fly unless we adopt, unless Hick adopts this kind of view that says, look, you've got to have these challenges. You've got these, these instances of suffering have to be present, and that produces a, a better kind of goodness than you could get if God just endowed it to you from the start. So, so it's a very um, uh, rich but embedded notion of goodness and omnipotence and power here that Hick is adopting. And it's the only way you're going to make sense of uh, reconciling, the only way you're going to reconcile God and suffering is to build up this kind of articulates. Okay, so um, the idea is that suffering makes us better and God can't shortcut that process. So over time human goodness slowly built up through the personal histories of moral effort has a value in the eyes of the Creator which justifies even the long travail of the slow of the soul making process.
All right, so so this long uh, process of enduring suf suffering here is justified because of the outcomes, because of the human goodness that comes out of it in the end. Uh, and the metaphor here that Hick likes is a parent metaphor. He uses this again and again. A good parent allows the child to suffer because the process is valuable and moral virtue cannot be achieved any other way. Because look, if you just provide everything for the child and you buffer them, you comfort them, you protect them from every possible boo-boo, from every uh, harm or, or, or the consequences of their own actions, if they screw up and then you clean up the mess, there's no learning there, there's no uh, adjustment of behavior, and there's no growth. Uh, furthermore, and this is an important uh, addition that Hick makes, it's not as if there's an accumulation from generation to generation of moral virtue. The process has to start over with each new individual who must exercise her freedom to achieve her own moral growth. So look, a baby that's born now that goes through the growth process and becomes an adult, that baby is going to be up against the same sorts of challenges that a human baby a hundred years ago was up against. So it's not like the moral virtue that was achieved uh, in that prior era sort of stays with us. Now there can be, I suppose, the accumulation of institutional moral virtue. I mean, we could think of things like um, the civil rights movement, the abolition of slavery, women's rights, gay rights. Maybe some of these, um, we, maybe we should think about some of these as accumulated permanent improvements that transcend individuals because they're embedded in culture, they're embedded in our social system, and those are institutions that keep going. But Hick's really interested in the moral virtue growth that individuals make. And ongoing challenges for every generation give the opportunity or set the stage, um, make this arena for those uh, in these challenges in. Um, and of course, you know, you know what the consequences here are. Everybody hates a spoiled brat. The alternative here is that if somebody's never, uh, never faces the consequences of their actions, or uh, they've got everything handed to them, uh, they're utterly obnoxious and we hate them. So the idea here is that evil builds souls. A loving parent does desire pleasure for his children, and this is Hick nodding to the evil uh, the, the, the evil atheists. The atheists are motivated to accept uh, atheism on the basis of the problem of evil and they seem to be after uh, just pleasure and happiness and a freedom of, from pain. Roe is going to look that way when we look at his article. And, and Hicks acknowledged that. Sure, a loving parent wants pleasure for their children, but you don't want pleasure at the expense of them having moral integrity, unselfishness, compassion, courage, humor, reverence for the truth, uh, and a capacity for love, those things can't happen in a kind of hedonic, a hedonistic utopia, a place where everything bends and everything gives and there's no consequence of its ability. We've got to learn from our mistakes. These pictures are nice because if you look at the Lance Armstrong face and the Bill Clinton face and maybe the George Bush face, but at least Lance Armstrong and Bill Clinton, uh, primatologists, people like uh, Franz Duvall, who we're going to look at uh, this semester, say that male chimps make that same expression, that same sort of uh, uh, pursed lips, uh, corners of the mouth turned down, uh, pressure, you know, uh, air pressure in the mouth. That, that male chimps will make that very same look when they've been ashamed publicly or when they're embarrassed publicly. Uh, and female, female chimps and female humans don't do it as much, but males will do that. And if you look around, you Google around, you look at any sort of uh, shamed, publicly shamed politician or somebody gets caught um, in the act, uh, get in trouble for something, the men will make. Okay, so uh, here's a question. Is Hick justifying natural evil or moral evil? And so far it sure seems like what we're talking about is moral evil. It appears that we need to be free to make our mistakes and learn from them. But there's, a, there's an added section here. There's, a, there's, a, there's an embellishment here that's really interesting from Hick. And this is actually, this is a quote from uh, Hick's, uh, another one of Hick's books. And, and forgive me for using the long quote here, but it's, very, it's a very astute point and it's right to the core of something we're getting at. Hicks says, suppose contrary to fact that this world were a paradise from which all possibility of pain and suffering were excluded, the consequences would be very far-reaching. 
No one would ever be injured by accident. The mountain climber, steeplejack, or plain child falling from a great height would float unharmed to the ground. The reckless driver would never meet with disaster. There would be no call to be concerned for others in time of need or danger, for in such a world there could be no real needs or dangers. A sort of bendy world, if you like. To make possible this continual series of individual adjustments, nature would have to work by special providences instead of running according to general laws, which men must learn to respect on penalty or of pain or death. The laws of nature would have to be extremely flexible. Sometimes gravity would operate, sometimes not. Sometimes an object would be hard and solid, sometimes soft. There could be no sciences, for there would be no enduring world structure to investigate. So, so here, really, what Hick is getting at is that that there's a sort of there's a justification for natural evil here too, because that equation, that's the universal law of gravitation, right there is an equation for suffering. Right, every time you fall and get hurt, that's why. That's gravity at work. So natural. So imagine the laws of nature on the whole, and what Hick is suggesting here is that part of the challenge, part of the arena that we need to be in, and the challenges we need to face, is that we have a structured, lawful world that uh, does a number of things. It provides us with opportunities to grow in knowledge and power. And if the world bends or folds or adapts or changes with special providences miraculously, then that's not going to help us. That's not. That's going to evade our grasp and evade our efforts to try to understand it intellectually. Um, but also having a world full of regular uniform laws of nature are going to make moral evil, moral good, moral choices, and moral virtue going to make those possible. Because look, you can't, you're not going to have opportunities for generosity or charity or uh, uh, beneficence, and you're not going to have opportunities to screw up if none of these uh, laws of nature can be counted on to follow through and do what they do. Now there's another sort of side question here I'm going to add, uh, and it, it's a bit abstract, but let's consider uh, this question. On the whole, when we look at the distribution and the pain and the suffering um, and the distribution of, of pain and suffering in, on the planet in the course of sentience, does it look like on the whole it gets justly distributed? That is, uh, do those those beings who are evil, do they suffer? And do those beings that are good, do they get uh, reward? And I think most people viewing from a distance would, would sort of off the cuff at least say uh, that, that, that the world doesn't look that way. There's lots of evil people who get ahead and there's lots of good people who suffer. And it's not as if um, the, the, the pattern is inverted either. It's more like the world the, the, the distribution of pain and suffering in the world that comes down on people is inexplicable. It's ineffable. It's, it's something we can't fathom. It's something we can't understand. It doesn't make any sense from our perspective. And I think that there's this there's a point available here to Hick and to theists who want to make this sort of theodicy, this justification for God and suffering. I think they can say they ought to say this, that the world needs to defy our understanding that way. The world, the distribution of pain and suffering in the world needs to defy our comprehension. And of course, that's, what's, that's, that's the obvious uh, response that people make when you consider the Holocaust or typhoid or leukemia or cancer or the pattern of distribution of suffering that we see in the world. It defies all um, apprehension. We can't fathom how it could be that children should be subjected to uh, sexual abuse or have leukemia or under, undergo other sorts of problems. And that's the way it needs to be in order for there to be these kinds of opportunities for us to exercise our virtue and achieve um, charity and courage and humor and all of those virtues that Hick is talking about. If the world made sense with this distribution, um, that wouldn't be possible anymore. Okay, now let me elaborate with a similar sort of discussion from another philosopher. So here we've got a, another long passage, but very insightful passage from another philosopher, Peter Van Ingwagen, who's writing on a similar topic. And Van Ingwagen's got an idea about another bendy world. And it's very suggestive about how 
uh, the Hick style, um, uh, theistic style, uh, uh, th this theodicy can work to justify both natural and moral evil. So consider uh, Van Ingwagen's comments. God, by means, uh, imagine a scenario where God, by means of a continuous series of ubiquitous miracles, causes a planet inhabited by the same animal life as the actual Earth to be a hedonic utopia. And on this planet, fawns are, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's just to test your Bible knowledge, saved by angels when they are in danger of being burnt alive. Harmful parasites and microorganisms suffer immediate supernatural dissolution if they enter a higher animal's body. Lambs are miraculously hidden from lions. And the lions are compensated for the resulting restriction on their diets by physically impossible falls of high protein manna. On this planet, either God created every species by a separate miracle, or else, although all living things evolved from a common ancestor, a hedonic utopia has existed at every stage of the evolutionary process. The latter alternative implies that God has, by means of a vast and intricately coordinated sequence of supernatural adjustments to the machinery of nature, guided the evolutionary process in such a way as to compensate for the fact that a hedonic utopia exerts no selection pressure. Now see, what Van Ingwagen's getting at here is a really, really interesting question about um, the role of suffering and evolution on planet Earth. Because if we look at evolution from this perspective, we realize that the engine of natural selection, the engine of, of adaptation in evolutionary history is pain and suffering. It's one species predating another species. It's one species starving or dying or being killed by another species or not being able to compete as well because it's not as well adapted. So without pain and suffering, you don't get evolution, says Van Ingwagen, unless, what Van, Ing Van, what Van Ingwagen is suggesting, unless you get God tinkering with everything, unless you get God sort of invading every little moment and every little corner of the universe and adjusting and altering and changing the course of things miraculously all the time. And Van Ingwagen calls this a massively irregular world. And Van Ingwagen suggests that maybe a massively irregular world like this is a bad thing. It would be better, on all things considered from God's perspective, to have a world that's regular, that's uniform, that unfolds. And for all we know, a world like that has to unfold that includes pain and suffering in it. For all we know, the options are either to have a world full of pain and suffering, like um, a world that has an evolution and natural selection in it, or we have a massively irregular world where God tinkers with every little, uh, every little event. And given those two options, it may be that God chooses the former, God chooses the pain and suffering, natural selection, evolution route in order to achieve his ends, because God needs a, ma a massively regular world, and there's no way to get that, and there's no way to have natural selection exert its pressure on the development of species, unless you have something like pain and suffering going on in there. So Van Ingwagen says, for all we know, that was an option that God couldn't avoid. So he suggests um, he's got this sort of compatibilist view about God, creation, and evolution on planet Earth. So I won't uh, sign in, or I, won't, I won't sort of delve any further into that little debate, but it's a really interesting suggestion coming from another philosopher who's given us a Okay, so now let's consider a couple of problems that get brought up about uh, John Hicks' soul-making theodicy. Uh, here's a question that's suggestive of an objection. Uh, if the only way to acquire moral virtue, as Hick has argued, is through making mistakes and learning, then what are we to think about God? Does God have moral virtue? If he does, if God does have moral virtue, then it would appear that he is not or was not morally perfect before he acquired it. If he does not have a moral virtue, then is he God? <clears throat> if there's another way to acquire moral, moral virtue, if it's possible to have it from the outset, then why can't we have it that way too, instead of having leukemia and child sex slavery to acquire it? If it's possible to be endowed with moral virtue like God is, then the soul-building defense won't work. And here's the, here's the issue. 
how a, a crucial part of Hicks' argument is is this idea that 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 goodness that's obtained through the soul making process through the long travail of suffering is better than goodness that you just get from the outset okay well it's just natural to point that question back at God then and say okay well what kind of goodness does God have did God acquire his virtue through this growth process well that would be weird because that means that God wasn't morally virtuous and then he got morally virtuous how did he do that did he do that in an arena of challenges like we're up against and now we're really getting far afield from the sort of the conventional view about God and God's goodness but if God can have some kind of ultimate moral virtue from the start without going through a process like that well then that seems to undermine the soul building defense again because if it's possible to ha just have it and be virtuous from the start, then why can't we have it that way too? Why can't God cut the corner here? Or why can't we um, achieve it without all of the circuitous path through all of this suffering? All right, so now that's more a list of questions, very suggestive questions, than a uh, full-blown objection. And I want to encourage you that when you write your problem of evil papers, for instance, that you not just ask open-ended questions, develop an argument here, and make a case against the argument that you're considering. Make a, turn those questions into assertions. But I'm going to leave these out there as very uh, suggestive of an argument that somebody might... Okay, one more objection, one more uh, problem to raise about Hick. Uh, and I'm going to call this do as I say, not as I do. Right, you remember when you caught your parents doing this one. We're supposed to develop moral virtue, according to Hick, in a world where the paragon of moral virtue, God himself, responds to widespread, horrific, and pointless suffering by refusing to do anything about it at all. That is, God leaves us to deal with it ourselves. And God's supposed to be this perfect paragon of moral virtue. But what he does is, okay, you guys deal with that. Holocaust, that's your problem. You take responsibility for that. You fix it. Cancer, that's your problem. Take responsibility for it. You fix it. You find a way to ch overcome that challenge. So God's behavior himself is, well... It's questionable. It's iffy. It's something that if we saw, I mean, ordinarily, if we see a human doing that, just standing by, ignoring someone while they drown, we think of them as moral monsters. But here, that seems to be exactly what God does, who's supposed to be the perfect, uh, the, the perfect example of moral virtue. So in effect, we're supposed to develop our capacities to take responsibility for suffering and prevent it wherever possible, while we acknowledge that the most loving and morally virtuous thing that can be done for those that suffer is to ignore their plight completely. That's what God, in his more infinite moral wisdom, has seen fit to do. And I don't mean this to be sarcastic, but I'm trying to bring out the point here. Uh, how is it that abandoning humans to face these challenges on their own is morally virtuous, yet we're not supposed to do that? We're supposed to have gener generosity and long-suffering and charity and beneficence and love uh, for our fellow humans and so on. So it looks like there's a weird kind of double standard here that raises questions. And we're going to see that come out again um, when Roe gives his um, argument for atheism on the basis of the problem of evil, and he gets some resistance from uh, other philosophers, and they start arguing about this parent metaphor. So uh, Hicks, uh, Hicks' God, if you will, looks like a very stern sort of paternal character, a very... Um, aloof and stern uh Okay, so let's summarize the big picture here. Uh, as according to Hick, the argument from evil um, has been misunderstood. Uh, it, it's, under, it's misunderstood how divine benevolence would manifest itself. Uh, people seem to be looking for all ice cream sundaes and happy and joy, uh, happiness and joy, and that's a mistake to see. Uh, that's a mistake to make that sort of demand on the world. A good parent would not make life a hedonistic paradise. That's a mistake. That's the that's the Paris Hilton problem for his children. In order, to, in order to develop moral virtue and grow intellectually, humans need an orderly, challenging world where they can learn from their mistakes, take responsibility for their actions, and acquire wisdom and develop moral virtue. And 
and next it's at least possible that moral virtue cannot be achieved any other way says Hick it's possible that the moral virtue gained on the whole is greater than the suffering experienced so it's possible that God permits or even creates evil to achieve that end and now I've stated this a bit even even a bit softer on Hick's behalf I actually think Hick has got a stronger view than this Hick doesn't think it's merely possible Hick thinks it's true Hick thinks that um, moral virtue can't be achieved any other way and that God did make it this way deliberately Okay, and we've considered a couple of objections. Uh, here's the first one, the questions. How did God get moral virtue? Wouldn't it be possible for us to get it that way too? Can't we be morally virtuous from the start? Why do we have to go through this circuitous route, all the pain and suffering to get there? And the do as I say, not as I do, the double standard problem. And that gives us at least the highlights um, overall of the uh, John Hick uh, um, uh, theodicy, the uh, suffering builds moral character argument.